Section 8 of A General View of Positivism. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Oxnard. A General View of Positivism by Auguste Comte. Translated by John Henry Bridges. Chapter 2. The Social Aspect of Positivism as shown by its connection with the general revolutionary movement of western europe part four after this brief exposition of positive morality i must allude with equal brevity to the means by which it will be established and applied these are of two kinds the first lay down the foundations of moral training for each individual they furnish principles and they regulate feelings the second carry out the work begun and ensure the application of the principles inculcated to practical life both these functions are in the first instance performed spontaneously under the influence of the doctrine and of the sympathies evoked by it but for their adequate performance a spiritual power specially devoted to the purpose is necessary the moral education of the positivist is based both upon reason and on feeling the latter having always the preponderance in accordance with the primary principle of the system the result of the rational basis is to bring moral precepts to the test of rigorous demonstration and to secure them against all dangers from discussion by showing that they rest upon the laws of our individual and social nature by knowing these laws we are enabled to form a judgment of the influence of each affection thought action or habit be that influence direct or indirect special or general in private life or in public convictions based upon such knowledge will be as deep as any that are formed in the present day from the strictest scientific evidence with the excess of intensity due to their higher importance and their close connection with our noblest feelings nor will such convictions be limited to those who are able to appreciate the logical value of the arguments we see constantly in other departments of positive science that men will adopt notions upon trust and carry them out with the same zeal and confidence as if they were thoroughly acquainted with all the grounds for their belief all that is necessary is that they should feel satisfied that their confidence is well bestowed the fact being in spite of all that is said of the independence of modern thought that it is often given too readily the most willing assent is yielded every day to the rules which mathematicians astronomers physicists chemists or biologists have laid down in their respective arts even in cases where the greatest interests are at stake and similar assent will certainly be accorded to moral rules when they like the rest shall be acknowledged to be susceptible of scientific proof but while using the force of demonstration to an extent hitherto impossible positivists will take care not to exaggerate its importance moral education even in its more systematic parts should rest principally upon feeling as the mere statement of the great human problem indicates the study of moral questions intellectually speaking is most valuable but the effect it leaves is not directly moral since the analysis will refer not to our own actions but to those of others for all scientific investigations to be impartial and free from confusion must be objective not subjective now to judge others without immediate reference to self is a process which may possibly result in strong convictions but so far from calling out right feelings it will if carried too far interfere with or check their natural development however the new school of moralists is the less likely to err in this direction that it would be totally inconsistent with that profound knowledge of human nature in which positivism has already shown itself so far superior to catholicism no one knows so well as the positivist that the principal source of real morality lies in direct exercise of our social sympathies whether systematic or spontaneous he will spare no efforts to develop these sympathies from the earliest years by every method which sound philosophy can indicate it is in this that moral education whether private or public principally consists and to it mental education is always to be held subordinate i shall revert to these remarks in the next chapter when i come to the general question of educating the people 
but however efficient the training received in youth it will not be enough to regulate our conduct in after years amidst all the distracting influences of practical life unless the same spiritual power which provides the education prolongs its influence over our maturity part of its task will be to recall individuals classes and even nations when the case requires it to principles which they have forgotten or misinterpreted and to instruct them in the means of applying them wisely and here even more than in the work of education strictly so called the appeal will be to feeling rather than to pure reason its force will be derived from public opinion strongly organized if the spiritual power awards its praise and blame justly public opinion as i shall show in the next chapter will lend it the most irresistible support this moral action of humanity upon each of her members has always existed whenever there was any real community of principles and feelings but its strength will be far greater under the positive system the reality of the doctrine and the social character of modern civilization give advantages to the new spiritual power which were denied to catholicism and these advantages are brought forward very prominently by the positive system of commemoration commemoration when regularly instituted is a most valuable instrument in the hands of a spiritual power for continuing the work of moral education it was the absolute character of catholicism even more than the defective state of medieval society that caused the failure of its noble aspirations to become the universal religion in spite of all its efforts its system of commemoration has always been restricted to very narrow limits both in time and space outside these limits catholicism has always shown the same blindness and injustice that it now complains of receiving from its own opponents positivism on the contrary can yield the full measure of praise to all times and all countries without either weakness or inconsistency possessing the true theory of human development every mode and phase of that development will be celebrated thus every moral precept will be supported by the influence of posterity and this in private life as well as in public for the system of commemoration will be applied in the same spirit to the humblest services as well as to the highest while reserving special details for the treaties to which this work is introductory i may yet give one illustration of this important aspect of positivism an illustration which probably will be the first step in the practical application of the system i would propose to institute in western europe on any days that may be thought suitable the yearly celebration of the three greatest of our predecessors caesar st paul and charmaine who are respectively the highest types of greco-roman civilization of medieval feudalism and of catholicism which form the link between the two periods the services of these illustrious men have never yet been adequately recognized for want of a sound historical theory enabling us to explain the prominent part which they played in the development of our race even in st paul's case the omission is noticeable positivism gives him a still higher place than has been given him by theology for it looks upon him as historically the founder of the religion which bears the inappropriate name of christianity in the other two cases the influence of positive principles is even more necessary for caesar has been almost equally misjudged by theological and by metaphysical writers and catholicism has done very little for the appreciation of charmaine however notwithstanding the absence of any systematic appreciation of these great men yet from the reverence with which they are generally regarded we can hardly doubt that the celebration here proposed would meet with ready acceptance throughout western europe to illustrate my meaning still further i may observe that history presents cases where exactly the opposite course is called for and which should be held up not for approbation but for infamy blame it is true should not be carried to the same extent as praise because it stimulates the destructive instincts to a degree which is always painful and sometimes injurious yet strong condemnation is occasionally desirable it strengthens social feelings and principles if only by giving more significance to our approval thus i would suggest that after doing honour to the three great men who have done so much to promote the development of our race there should be a solemn reprobation of the two principal opponents of progress julian and bonaparte the latter being the more criminal of the two the former the more insensate 
their influence has been sufficiently extensive to allow of all the western nations joining in this damnatory verdict the principal function of the spiritual power is to direct the future of society by means of education and as a supplementary part of education to pronounce judgment upon the past in the mode here indicated but there are functions of another kind relating more immediately to the present and these too result naturally from its position as an educating body if the educators are men worthy of their position it will give them an influence over the whole course of practical life whether private or public of course it will merely be the influence of counsel and practical men will be free to accept or reject it but its weight may be very considerable when given prudently and when the authority from which it proceeds is recognized as competent the questions on which its advice is most needed are the relations between different classes its action will be coextensive with the diffusion of positive principles for nations professing the same faith and sharing in the same education will naturally accept the same intellectual and moral directors in the next chapter i shall treat this subject more in detail i merely mention it here as one among the list of functions belonging to the new spiritual power it will now not be difficult to show all the characteristics of positivism are summed up in the motto order and progress a motto which has a philosophical as well as a political bearing and which i shall always feel glad to have put forward positivism is the only school which has given a definite significance to these two conceptions whether regarded from their scientific or their social aspect with regard to progress the assertion will hardly be disputed no definition of it but the positive ever having yet been given in the case of order it is less apparent but as i have shown in the first chapter it is no less profoundly true all previous philosophies had regarded order as stationary a conception which rendered it wholly inapplicable to modern politics but positivism by rejecting the absolute and yet not introducing the arbitrary represents order in a totally new light and adapts it to our progressive civilization it places it on the firmest possible foundation that is on the doctrine of the invariability of the laws of nature which defends it against all danger from subjective chimeras the positivist regards artificial order in social phenomena as in all others as resting necessarily upon the order of nature in other words upon the whole series of natural laws but order has to be reconciled with progress and here positivism is still more obviously without a rival necessary as the reconciliation is no other system has even attempted it but the facility with which we are now enabled by the encyclopedic scale to pass from the simplest mathematical phenomena to the most complicated phenomena of political life leads at once to a solution of the problem viewed scientifically it is an instance of that necessary correlation of existence and movement which we find indicated in the inorganic world and which becomes still more distinct in biology finding it in all the lower sciences we are prepared for its appearance in a still more definite shape in sociology here its practical importance becomes more obvious though it had been implicitly involved before in sociology the correlation assumes this form order is the condition of all progress progress is always the object of order or to penetrate the question still more deeply progress may be regarded simply as the development of order for the order of nature necessarily contains within itself the germ of all possible progress the rational view of human affairs is to look on all their changes not as new creations but as new evolutions and we find this principle fully borne out in history every social innovation has its roots in the past and the rudest phases of savage life show the primitive trace of all subsequent improvement progress then is in its essence identical with order and may be looked upon as order made manifest therefore in explaining this double conception on which the science and art of society depend we may at present limit ourselves to the analysis of progress thus simplified it is more easy to grasp especially now that the novelty and importance of the question of progress are attracting so much attention 
for the public is becoming instinctively alive to its real significance as the basis on which all sound moral and political teaching must henceforth rest taking then this point of view we may say that the one great object of life personal and social is to become more perfect in every way in our external condition first but also and more especially in our own nature the first kind of progress we share in common with the higher animals all of which make some efforts to improve their material position it is of course the least elevated stage of progress but being the easiest it is the point from which we start towards the higher stages a nation that has made no efforts to improve itself materially will take but little interest in moral or mental improvement this is the only ground on which enlightened men can feel much pleasure in the material progress of our time it stirs up influences that tend to the nobler kinds of progress influences which would meet with even greater opposition than they do were not the temptations presented to the coarser natures by material prosperity so irresistible owing to the mental and moral anarchy in which we live systematic efforts to gain the higher degrees of progress are as yet impossible and this explains though it does not justify the exaggerated importance attributed nowadays to material improvements but the only kinds of improvement really characteristic of humanity are those which concern our own nature and even here we are not quite alone for several of the higher animals show some slight tendencies to improve themselves physically progress in the higher sense includes improvements of three sorts that is to say it may be physical intellectual or moral progress the difficulty of each class being in proportion to its value and the extent of its sphere physical progress which again might be divided on the same principle seems under some of its aspects almost the same thing as material but regarded as a whole it is far more important and far more difficult its influence on the well-being of man is also much greater we gain more for instance by the smallest addition to length of life or by any increased security for health than by the most elaborate improvements in our modes of travelling by land or water in which birds will probably always have a great advantage over us however as i said before physical progress is not exclusively confined to man some of the animals for instance advance as far as cleanliness which is the first step in the progressive scale intellectual and moral progress then is the only kind really distinctive of our race individual animals sometimes show it but never a whole species except as a consequence of prolonged intervention on the part of man between these two highest grades as between the two lower we shall find a difference of value extent and difficulty always supposing the standard to be the manner in which they affect man's well-being collectively or individually to strengthen the intellectual powers whether for art or for science whether it be the powers of observation or those of induction and deduction is when circumstances allow of their being made available for social purposes of greater and more extensive importance than all physical and a fortiori than all material improvements but we know from the fundamental principle laid down in the first chapter of this work that moral progress has even more to do with our well-being than intellectual progress the moral faculties are more modifiable although the effort required to modify them is greater if the benevolence or courage of the human race were increased it would bring more real happiness than any addition to our intellectual powers therefore to the question what is the true object of human life whether looked at collectively or individually the simplest and most precise answer would be the perfection of our moral nature since it has a more immediate and certain influence on our well-being than perfection of any other kind all the other kinds are necessary if for no other reason than to prepare the way for this but from the very fact of this connection it may be regarded as their representative since it involves them all implicitly and stimulates them to increased activity keeping then to the question of moral perfection we find two qualities standing above the rest in practical importance namely sympathy and energy both these qualities are included in the word heart which in all european languages has a different meaning for the two sexes both will be developed by positivism more directly more continuously and with greater result than under any former system 
the whole tendency of positivism is to encourage sympathy since it subordinates every thought desire and action to social feeling energy is also presupposed and at the same time fostered by the system for it removes the heavy weight of superstition it reveals the true dignity of man and it supplies an unceasing motive for individual and collective action the very acceptance of positivism demands some vigour of character it implies the braving of spiritual terrors which were once enough to intimidate the firmest minds progress then may be regarded under four successive aspects material physical intellectual and moral each of these might again be divided on the same principle and we should then discover several intermediate phases these cannot be investigated here and i have only to note that the philosophical principle of this analysis is precisely the same as that on which i have based the classification of the sciences in both cases the order followed is that of increasing generality and complexity in the phenomena the only difference is in the mode in which the two arrangements are developed for scientific purposes the lower portion of the scale has to be expanded into greater detail while from the social point of view attention is concentrated on the higher parts but whether it be the scale of the true or that of the good the conclusion is the same in both both alike indicate the supremacy of social considerations both point to universal love as the highest ideal end of section eight section nine of a general view of positivism this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by greg oxnard a general view of positivism by auguste comte translated by john henry bridges chapter two the social aspect of positivism as shown by its connection with the general revolutionary movement of western europe part five i have now explained the principal purpose of positive philosophy namely spiritual reorganization and i have shown how that purpose is involved in the positivist motto order and progress positivism then realizes the highest aspirations of medieval catholicism and at the same time fulfils the conditions the absence of which caused the failure of the convention it combines the opposite merits of the catholic and the revolutionary spirit and by so doing supersedes them both theology and metaphysics may now disappear without danger because the service which each of them rendered is now harmonized with that of the other and will be performed more perfectly the principle on which this result depends is the separation of spiritual from temporal power this it will be remembered had always been the chief subject of contention between the two antagonistic parties i have spoken of the moral and mental reorganization of western europe as characterizing the second phase of the revolution let us now see what are its relations with the present state of politics of course the development of positivism will not be much affected by the retrograde tendencies of the day whether theological or metaphysical still the general course of events will exercise an influence upon it of which it is important to take account so too although the new doctrine cannot at present do much to modify its surroundings there are yet certain points in which action may be taken at once in the fourth volume of this treatise the question of a transitional policy will be carefully considered with the view of facilitating the advent of the normal state which social science indicates in a more distant future i cannot complete this chapter without some notice of this provisional policy which must be carried on until positivism has made its way to general acceptance the principal feature of this policy is that it is temporary to set up any permanent institution in a society which has no fixed opinions or principle of life would be hopeless until the most important questions are thoroughly settled both in principle and practice the only measures of the least utility are those which facilitate the process of reconstruction measures adopted with a view to permanence must end as we have seen them end so often in disappointment and failure however enthusiastically they may have been received at first 
inevitable as this consequence of our revolutionary position is it has never been understood except by the great leaders of the republican movement in seventeen ninety three of the various governments that we have had during the last two generations all except the convention have fallen into the vain delusion of attempting to found permanent institutions without waiting for any intellectual or moral basis and therefore it is that none but the convention has left any deep traces in men's thoughts or feelings all its principal measures even those which concerned the future more than the present were avowedly provisional and the consequence was that they harmonized well with the peculiar circumstances of the time the true philosopher will always look with respectful admiration on these men who not only had no rational theory to guide them but were encumbered with false metaphysical notions and who yet notwithstanding proved themselves the only real statesmen that western europe can boast of since the time of frederick the great indeed the wisdom of their policy would be almost unaccountable only that the very circumstances which called for it so urgently were to some extent calculated to suggest it the state of things was such as to make it impossible to settle the government on any permanent basis again amidst all the wild extravagance of the principles in vogue the necessity of a strong government to resist foreign invasion counteracted many of their worst effects on the removal of this salutary pressure the convention fell into the common error though to a less extent than the constituent assembly it set up a constitution framed according to some abstract model which was supposed to be final but which did not last so long as the period originally proposed for its own provisional labours it is on this first period of its government that its fame rests the plan originally proposed was that the government of the convention should last till the end of the war if this plan could have been carried out it would probably have been extended still further as the impossibility of establishing any permanent system would have been generally recognized the only avowed motive for making the government provisional was of course the urgent necessity of national defence but beneath this temporary motive which for the time superseded every other consideration there was another and a deeper motive for it which could not have been understood without sounder historical principles than were at that time possible that motive was the utterly negative character of the metaphysical doctrines then accepted and the consequent absence of any intellectual or moral basis for political reconstruction this of course was not recognized but it was really the principal reason why the establishment of any definite system of government was delayed had the war been brought to an end clearer views of the subject would no doubt have been formed indeed they had been formed already in the opposite camp by men of the neo-catholic school who were not absorbed by the urgent question of defending the republic what blinded men to the truth was the fundamental yet inevitable error of supposing the critical doctrines of the preceding generation applicable to purposes of construction they were undeceived at last by the utter anarchy which the triumph of these principles occasioned and the next generation occupied itself with the counter-revolutionary movement in which similar attempts at finality were made by the various reactionist parties for these parties were quite as destitute as their opponents of any principles suited to the task of reconstruction and they had to fall back upon the old system as the only recognized basis on which public order could be maintained and in this respect the situation is still unchanged it still retains its revolutionary character and any immediate attempt to reorganize political administration would only be the signal for fresh attempts at reaction attempts which now can have no other result than anarchy it is true that positivism has just supplied us with a philosophical basis for political reconstruction but its principles are still so new and undeveloped and besides are understood by so few that they cannot exercise much influence at present on political life ultimately and by slow degrees they will mould the institutions of the future but meanwhile they must work their way freely into men's minds and hearts and for this at least one generation will be necessary spiritual organization is the only point where an immediate beginning can be made difficult as it is its possibility is at last as certain as its urgency 
when sufficient progress has been made with it it will cause a gradual regeneration of political institutions but any attempt to modify these too rapidly would only result in fresh disturbances such disturbances it is true will never be as dangerous as they were formerly because the anarchy of opinion is so profound that it is far more difficult for men to agree in any fixed principles of action the absolute doctrines of the last century which inspired such intense conviction can never regain their strength because when brought to the crucial test of experience as well as of discussion their uselessness for constructive purposes and their subversive tendency became evident to every one they have been weakened too by theological concessions which their supporters in order to carry on the government at all were obliged to make consequently the policy with which they are at present connected is one which oscillates between reaction and anarchy or rather which is at once despotic and destructive from the necessity of controlling a society which has become almost as diverse to metaphysical as to theological rule in the utter absence then of any general convictions the worst forms of political commotion are not to be feared because it would be impossible to rouse men's passions sufficiently but unwise efforts to set up a permanent system of government will even now lead in certain cases to lamentable disorder and would at all events be utterly useless quiet at home depends now like peace abroad simply on the absence of disturbing forces a most insecure basis since it is itself a symptom of the extent to which the disorganizing movement has proceeded this singular condition must necessarily continue until the interregnum which at present exists in the moral and intellectual region comes to an end as long as there is such an utter want of harmony in feeling as well as in opinion there can be no real security against war or internal disorder the existing equilibrium has arisen so spontaneously that it is no doubt less unstable than is generally supposed still it is sufficiently precarious to excite continual panics both at home and abroad which are not only very irritating but often exercise a most injurious influence over our policy now attempts at immediate reconstruction of political institutions instead of improving this state of things make it very much worse by giving factitious life to the old doctrines which being thoroughly worn out ought to be left to the natural process of decay the inevitable result of restoring them to official authority will be to deter the public and even the thinking portion of it from that free exercise of the mental powers by which and by which only we may hope to arrive without disturbance at fixed principles of action the cessation of war therefore justifies no change in republican policy as long as the spiritual interregnum lasts it must retain its provisional character indeed this character ought to be more strongly impressed upon it than ever for no one now has any real belief in the organic value of the received metaphysical doctrines they would never have been revived but for the need of having some sort of political formula to work with in default of any real social convictions but the revival is only apparent and it contrasts most strikingly with the utter absence of systematic principles in most active minds there is no real danger of repeating the error of the first revolutionists and of attempting to construct with negative doctrines we have only to consider the vast development of industry of aesthetic culture and of scientific study to free ourselves from all anxiety on this head such things are incompatible with any regard for the metaphysical teaching of ideologists or psychologists nor is there much to fear in the natural enthusiasm which is carrying us back to the first days of the revolution it will only revive the old republican spirit and make us forget the long period of retrogression and stagnation which have elapsed since the first great outbreak for this is the point on which the attention of posterity will be finally concentrated but while satisfying these very legitimate feelings the people will soon find that the only aspect of this great crisis which we have to imitate is the wise insight of the convention during the first part of its administration in perceiving that its policy could only be provisional and that definite reconstruction must be reserved for better times we may fairly hope that the next formal attempt to set up a constitution according to some abstract ideal 
will convince the french nation and ultimately the whole west of the utter futility of such schemes besides the free discussion which has now become habitual to us and the temper of the people which is as sceptical of political entities as of christian mysteries would make any such attempts extremely difficult never was there a time so unfavourable to doctrines admitting of no real demonstration demonstration being now the only possible basis of permanent belief supposing then a new constitution to be set on foot and the usual time to be spent in the process of elaborating it public opinion will very possibly discard it before it is completed not allowing it even the short average duration of former constitutions any attempt to check free discussion on the subject would defeat its own object since free discussion is the natural consequence of our intellectual and social position the same conditions which require our policy to be provisional while the spiritual interanium lasts points also to the mode in which this provisional policy should be carried out had the revolutionary government of the convention continued till the end of the war it would probably have been prolonged up to the present time but in one most important respect a modification would have been necessary during the struggle for independence what was wanted was a vigorous dictatorship combining spiritual with temporal powers a dictatorship even stronger than the old monarchy and only distinguished from despotism by its ardour in the cause of progress without complete concentration of political power the republic could never have been saved but with peace the necessity for such concentration was at an end the only motive for still continuing the provisional system was the absence of social convictions but this would also be a motive for giving perfect liberty of speech and discussion which till then had been impossible or dangerous for liberty was a necessary condition for elaborating and diffusing a new system of universal principles as the only sure basis for the future regeneration of society this hypothetical view of changes which might have taken place in the conventional government may be applied to the existing condition of affairs it is the policy best adapted for the republican government which is now arising in all the security of a settled peace and yet amidst the most entire anarchy of opinion the successors of the convention men unworthy of their task degraded the progressive dictatorship entrusted to them by the circumstances of the time into a retrograde tyranny during the reign of charles x which was the last phase of the reaction the central power was thoroughly undermined by the legal opposition of the parliamentary or local power the central government still refused to recognize any limits to its authority but the growth of free thought made its claims to spiritual jurisdiction more and more untenable leaving it merely the temporal authority requisite for public order during the neutral period which followed the counter-revolution the dictatorship was not merely restricted to its proper functions but was legally destroyed that is the local power as represented by parliament took the place of the central power all pretensions to spiritual influence were abandoned by both their thoughts being sufficiently occupied with the maintenance of material order the intellectual anarchy of the time made this task difficult enough but they aggravated the difficulty by unprincipled attempts to establish their government on the basis of pure self-interest irrespectively of all moral considerations the restoration of the republic and the progressive spirit aroused by it has no doubt given to both legislative and executive a large increase of power to an extent indeed which a few years back would have caused violent antipathy but it would be a grievous error for either of them to attempt to imitate the dictatorial style of the conventional government unsuccessful in any true sense as the attempt would be it might occasion very serious disturbances which like the obsolete metaphysical principles in which they originate would be equally dangerous to order and to progress we see then that in the total absence of any fixed principles on which men can unite the policy required is one which shall be purely provisional and limited almost entirely to the maintenance of material order if order be preserved the situation is in all other respects most favourable to the work of mental and moral regeneration which will prepare the way for the society of the future 
the establishment of a republic in france disproves the false claims set up by official writers in behalf of constitutional government as if it was the final issue of the revolution meantime there is nothing irrevocable in the republic itself except the moral principle involved in it the absolute and permanent preponderance of social feeling in other words the concentration of all the powers of man upon the common welfare this is the only maxim of the day which we can accept as final it needs no formal sanction because it is merely the expression of feelings generally avowed all prejudices against it having been entirely swept away but with the doctrines and the institutions resulting from them through which this dominion of social feeling is to become an organized reality the republic has no direct connection it would be compatible with many different solutions of the problem politically the only irrevocable point is the abolition of monarchy which for a long time has been in france and to a less extent throughout the west the symbol of retrogression that spirit of devotion to the public welfare which is the noblest feature of republicanism is strongly opposed to any immediate attempts at political finality as being incompatible with conscientious endeavours to find a real solution of social problems for before the practical solution can be hoped for a systematic basis for it must exist and this we can hardly expect to find in the remnants left to us of the old creeds all that the true philosopher desires is simply that the question of moral and intellectual reorganization shall be left to the unrestricted efforts of thinkers of whatever school and in advocating this cause he will plead the interests of the republic for the safety of which it is of the utmost importance that no special set of principles should be placed under official patronage republicanism then will do far more to protect free thought and resist political encroachment than was done during the orleanist government by the retrograde instincts of catholicism catholic resistance to political reconstructions was strong but blind its place will now be more than supplied by wise indifference on the part of the public which has learned by experience the inevitable failure of these incoherent attempts to realize metaphysical utopias the only danger of the position is lest it divert the public even the more reflective portion of it from deep and continuous thought to practical experiments based on superficial and hasty considerations it must be owned that the temper of mind which now prevails would have been most unfavourable for the original elaboration of positivism that work however had already been accomplished under the constitutional system which while not so restrictive as the preceding government was yet sufficiently so to concentrate our intellectual powers which of themselves would have been too feeble upon the task the original conception had indeed been formed during the preceding reign but its development and diffusion took place under the parliamentary system positivism now offers itself for practical application to the question of social progress which has become again the prominent question and will ever remain so unfavourable as the present political temper would have been to the rise of positivism it is not at all so to its diffusion always supposing its teachers to be men of sufficient dignity to avoid the snare of political ambition into which thinkers are now so apt to fall by explaining as it alone can explain the futility and danger of the various utopian schemes which are now competing with each other for the reorganization of society positivism will soon be able to divert public attention from these political chimeras to the question of a total reformation of principles and of life republicanism then will offer no obstacle to the diffusion of positivist principles indeed there is one point of view from which we may regard it as the commencement of the normal state it will gradually lead to the recognition of the fundamental principle that spiritual power must be wholly independent of every kind of temporal power whether central or local it is not merely that statesmen will soon have to confess their inability to decide on the merits of a doctrine which supposes an amount of deep scientific knowledge from which they must necessarily be precluded besides this the disturbance caused by the ambition of metaphysical schemers who are incapable of understanding the times in which they live will induce the public to withdraw their confidence from such men and to give it only to those who are content to abandon all political prospects 
and to devote themselves to their proper function as philosophers thus republicanism is on the whole favourable to this great principle of positivism the separation of temporal from spiritual power notwithstanding the temptations offered to men who wish to carry their theories into immediate application the principle seems no doubt in opposition to all our revolutionary prejudices but the public as well as the government will be brought to it by experience they will find it the only means of saving society from the consequences of metaphysical utopias by which order and progress are alike threatened thinkers too those of them at least who are sincere will cease to regard it with such blind antipathy when they see that while it condemns their aspirations to political influence it opens out to them a noble and most extensive sphere of moral influence independently of social considerations it is the only way in which the philosopher can maintain the dignity to which his position entitles him and which is at present so often compromised by the very success of his political ambition the political attitude which ought for the present to be assumed is so clearly indicated by all the circumstances of the time that practical instinct has in this respect anticipated theory the right view is well expressed in the motto liberty and public order which was adopted spontaneously by the middle class at the commencement of the neutral period in eighteen thirty it is not known who was the author of it but it is certainly far too progressive to be considered as representing the feelings of the monarchy it is not of course the expression of any systematic convictions but no metaphysical school could have pointed out so clearly the two principal conditions required by the situation positivism while accepting it as an inspiration of popular wisdom makes it more complete by adding two points which should have been contained in it at first only that they were too much opposed to existing prejudices to have been sanctioned by public opinion both parts of the motto require some expansion liberty ought to include perfect freedom of teaching public order should involve the preponderance of the central power over the local i subjoin a few brief remarks on these two points which will be considered more fully in the fourth volume of this treatise positivism is now the only consistent advocate of free speech and free inquiry schools of opinion which do not rest on demonstration and would consequently be shaken by any argumentative attacks can never be sincere in their wish for liberty in the extended sense here given to it liberty of writing we have now had for a long time but besides this we want liberty of speech and also liberty of teaching that is to say the abandonment by the state of all its educational monopolies freedom of teaching of which positivists are the only genuine supporters has become a condition of the first importance and this not merely as a provisional measure but as an indication of the normal state of things in the first place it is the only means by which any doctrine that has the power of fixing and harmonizing men's convictions can become generally known to legalize any system of education would imply that such a doctrine had already been found it most assuredly is not the way to find it but again freedom of teaching is a step toward the natural state it amounts to an admission that the problem of education is one which temporal authorities are incompetent to solve positivists would be the last to deny that education ought to be regularly organized only they assert first that as long as the spiritual interregnum lasts no organization is possible and secondly that whenever the acceptance of a new synthesis makes it possible it will be affected by the spiritual power to which that synthesis gives rise in the meantime no general system of state education should be attempted it will be well however to continue state assistance to those branches of instruction which are the most liable to be neglected by private enterprise especially reading and writing moreover there are certain institutions either established or revived by the convention for higher training in special subjects these ought to be carefully preserved and brought up to the present state of our knowledge for they contain the germs of principles which will be most valuable when the problem of reorganizing general education comes before us but all the institutions abolished by the convention ought now to be finally suppressed 
even the academies should form no exception to this rule for the harm which they have done both intellectually and morally since their reinstalment has fully justified the wisdom of the men who decided on their abolition government should no doubt exercise constant vigilance over all private educational institutions but this should have nothing to do with their doctrines but with their morality a point scandalously neglected in the present state of the law these should be the limits of state interference in education with these exceptions it should be left to the unrestricted efforts of private associations so as to give every opportunity for a definitive educational system to establish itself for to pretend that any satisfactory system exists at present would only be a hypocritical subterfuge on the part of the authorities the most important step toward freedom of education would be the suppression of all grants to theological or metaphysical societies leaving each man free to support the religion and the system of instruction which he prefers this however should be carried out in a just and liberal spirit worthy of the cause and without the least taint of personal dislike or party feeling full indemnity should be given to members of churches or universities upon whom these changes would come unexpectedly by acting in this spirit it will be far less difficult to carry out measures which are obviously indicated by the position in which we stand as there is now no doctrine which commands general assent it would be an act of retrogression to give legal sanction to any of the old creeds whatever their former claim to spiritual ascendancy it is quite in accordance with the republican spirit to refuse such sanction notwithstanding the tendency that there is to allow ideologists to succeed to the academic offices held under the constitutional system by psychologists but positivism will have as beneficial an influence on public order as on liberty it holds in exact opposition to revolutionary prejudices that the central power should preponderate over the local the constitutionalist principle of separating the legislative from the executive is only an empirical imitation of the larger principle of separating temporal and spiritual power which was adopted in the middle ages there will always be a contest for political supremacy between the central and local authorities and it is an error into which from various causes we have fallen recently to attempt to balance them against each other the whole tendency of french history has been to let the central power preponderate until it degenerated and became retrograde towards the end of the seventeenth century our present preference for the local power is therefore an historical anomaly which is sure to cease as soon as the fear of reaction has passed away and as republicanism secures us against any dangers of this kind our political sympathies will soon resume their old course the advantages of the central power are first that it is more directly responsible than the other and secondly that it is more practical and less likely to set up any claims to spiritual influence this last feature is of the highest importance and is likely to become every day more marked whereas the local or legislative power not having its functions clearly defined is very apt to interfere in theoretical questions without being in any sense qualified for doing so its preponderance would then in most cases be injurious to intellectual freedom which as it feels instinctively will ultimately result in the rise of a spiritual authority destined to supersede its own on the strength of these tendencies which have never before been explained positivists have little hesitation in siding in almost all cases with the central as against the local power philosophers whom no one can accuse of reactionist or servile views who have given up all political prospects and who are devoting themselves wholly to the work of spiritual reorganization need not be afraid to take this course and they ought to exert themselves vigorously in making the central power preponderant limiting the functions of the local power to what is strictly indispensable and notwithstanding all appearances to the contrary republicanism will help to modify the revolutionary feeling on this point it removes the distrust of authority caused naturally by the retrograde spirit of the old monarchy and it makes it easier to repress any further tendencies of the same kind without necessitating an entire change in the character of our policy for the sake of providing against a contingency of which there is now so little fear 
as soon as the central power has given sufficient proof of its progressive intentions there will be no unwillingness on the part of the french public to restrict the powers of the legislative body whether by reducing it to one-third of its present numbers which are so far too large or even by limiting its functions to the annual vote of the supplies during the last phase of the counter-revolution and the long period of parliamentary government which followed a state of feeling has arisen on this subject which is quite exceptional and which sound philosophical teaching and wise action on the part of government will easily modify it is inconsistent with the whole course of french history and only leads us into the mistake of imitating the english constitution which is adapted to no other country the very extension which has just been given to the representative system will bring it into discredit by showing it to be as futile and subversive in practice as philosophy had represented it to be in theory such then is the way in which positivism would interpret these two primary conditions of our present policy liberty and public order but besides this it explains and confirms the connection which exists between them it teaches in the first place that true liberty is impossible at present without the vigorous control of a central power progressive in the true sense of the word wise enough to abdicate all spiritual influence and keep to its own practical functions such a power is needed in order to check the despotic spirit of the various doctrines now in vogue as all of them are more or less inconsistent with the principle of separation of powers they would all be willing to employ forcible means of securing uniformity of opinion besides the anarchy which is caused by our spiritual interanium might but for a strong government very probably interfere with the philosophical freedom which we now enjoy conversely unless liberty in the sense here spoken of be granted it will be impossible for the central power to maintain itself in the position which public order requires the obstacle to that position at present is the fear of reaction and the scrupulous regard for freedom is the only means of removing these feelings which though perhaps unfounded are but too natural all fears will be allayed at once when liberty of instruction and association become part of the law of the land there will then be no hope and indeed no wish on the part of the government to regulate our social institutions in conformity with any particular doctrine the object of this chapter has been to show the social value of positivism we have found that not merely does it throw light upon our future policy but that it also teaches us how to act upon the present and these indications have in both cases been based upon careful examination of the past in accordance with the fundamental laws of human development it is the only system capable of handling the problem now proposed by the more advanced portion of our race to all who would claim to guide them that problem is this to reorganize human life irrespectively of god or king recognizing the obligation of no motive whether public or private other than social feeling aided in due measure by the positive science and practical energy of man End of section 9section 10 of a general view of positivism this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by greg oxnard a general view of positivism by august comte translated by john henry bridges chapter 3 the action of positivism upon the working classes part 1 positivism whether looked at as a philosophical system or as an instrument of social renovation cannot count upon much support from any of the classes whether in church or state by whom the government of mankind has hitherto been conducted there will be isolated exceptions of great value and these will soon become more numerous but the prejudices and passions of these classes will present serious obstacles to the work of moral and mental reorganization which constitutes the second phase of the great western revolution their faulty education and their repugnance to system prejudice them against a philosophy which subordinates specialties to general principles their aristocratic instincts make it very difficult for them to recognize the supremacy of social feeling that doctrine which lies at the root of social regeneration as conceived by positivism 
that no support can be expected from the classes who were in the ascendant before the revolution is of course obvious and we shall probably meet with opposition quite as real though more carefully concealed from the middle classes to whom that revolution transferred the authority and social influence which they had long been coveting their thoughts are entirely engrossed with the acquisition of power and they concern themselves but little with the mode in which it is used or the objects to which it is directed they were quite convinced that the revolution had found a satisfactory issue in the parliamentary system instituted during the recent period of political oscillation they will long continue to regret that stationary period because it was peculiarly favourable to their restless ambition a movement tending to the complete regeneration of society is almost as much dreaded now by the middle classes as it was formerly by the higher and both would at all events agree in prolonging the system of theological hypocrisy as far as republican institutions admitted of it that policy is now the only means by which retrogression is still possible ignoble as it is there are two motives for adopting it it secures respect and submission on the part of the masses and it imposes no unpleasant duties on their governors all their critical and metaphysical prejudices indispose them to terminate the state of spiritual anarchy which is the greatest obstacle to social regeneration while at the same time their ambition dreads the establishment of a new moral authority the restrictive influence of which would of course press most heavily upon themselves in the eighteenth century men of rank and even kings accepted the purely negative philosophy that was then in vogue it removed many obstacles it was an easy path to reputation and it imposed no great sacrifice but we can hardly hope from this precedent that the wealthy and literary classes of our own time will be equally willing to accept positive philosophy the avowed purpose of which is to discipline our intellectual powers in order to reorganize our modes of life the avowal of such a purpose is quite sufficient to prevent positivism from gaining the sympathies of any one of the governing classes the classes to which it must appeal are those who have been left untrained in the present worthless methods of instruction by words and entities who are animated with strong social instincts and who consequently have the largest stock of good sense and good feeling in a word it is among the working classes that the new philosophers will find their most energetic allies they are the two extreme terms in the social series as finally constituted and it is only through their combined action that social regeneration can become a practical possibility notwithstanding their difference of position a difference which indeed is more apparent than real there are strong affinities between them both morally and intellectually both have the same sense of the real the same preference for the useful and the same tendency to subordinate special points to general principles morally they resemble each other in generosity of feeling in wise unconcern for material prospects and in indifference to worldly grandeur this at least will be the case as soon as philosophers in the true sense of that word have mixed sufficiently with the nobler members of the working classes to raise their own character to its proper level when the sympathies which unite them upon these essential points have had time to show themselves it will be felt that the philosopher is under certain aspects a member of the working class fully trained while the working man is in many respects a philosopher without the training both too will look with similar feelings upon the intermediate or capitalist class as that class is necessarily the possessor of material power the pecuniary existence of both will as a rule be independent upon it these affinities follow as a natural result from their respective position and functions the reason of their not having been recognized more distinctly is that at present we have nothing that can be called a philosophic class or at least it is only represented by a few isolated types workmen worthy of their position are happily far less rare but hitherto it is only in france or rather in paris that they have shown themselves in their true light as men emancipated from chimerical beliefs and careless of the empty prestige of social position it is then only in paris that the truth of the preceding remarks can be fully verified the occupations of working men are evidently far more conducive to philosophical views than those of the middle classes since they are not so absorbing as to prevent continuous thought even during the hours of labour and besides having more time for thinking they have a moral advantage in the absence of any responsibility when their work is over 
the workman is preserved by his position from the schemes of aggrandizement which are constantly harassing the capitalist their difference in this respect causes a corresponding difference in their modes of thought the one cares more for general principles the other more for details to a sensible workman the system of dispersive specialty now so much in vogue shows itself in its true light he sees it that is to be brutalizing because it would condemn his intellect to the most paltry mode of culture so much so that it will never be accepted in france in spite of the irrational endeavours of our anglo maniac economists to the capitalist on the contrary and even to the man of science that system however rigidly and consistently carried out will seem far less degrading or rather it will be looked upon as most desirable unless his education has been such as to counteract these tendencies and to give him the desire and the ability for abstract and general thought morally the contrast between the position of the workman and the capitalist is even more striking proud as most men are of worldly success the degree of moral or mental excellence implied in the acquisition of wealth or power even when the means used have been strictly legitimate is hardly such as to justify that pride looking at intrinsic qualities rather than at visible results it is obvious that practical success whether in industry or in war depends far more on character than on intellect or affection the principal condition for it is the combination of a certain amount of energy with great caution and a fair share of perseverance when a man has these qualities mediocrity of intellect and moral deficiency will not prevent his taking advantage of favourable chances chance being usually a very important element in worldly success indeed it would hardly be an exaggeration to say that poverty of thought and feeling has often something to do with forming and maintaining the disposition requisite for the purpose vigorous exertion of the active powers is more frequently induced by the personal propensities of avarice ambition or vanity than by the higher instincts superiority of position when legitimately obtained deserves respect but the philosopher like the religionist and with still better grounds refuses to regard it as a proof of moral superiority a conclusion which would be wholly at variance with the true theory of human nature the life of the workman on the other hand is far more favourable to the development of the nobler instincts in practical qualities he is usually not wanting except in caution a deficiency which makes his energy and perseverance less useful to himself though fully available for society but it is in the exercise of the higher feelings that the moral superiority of the working class is most observable when our habits and opinions have been brought under the influence of systematic principles the true character of this class which forms the basis of modern society will become more distinct and we shall see that home affections are naturally stronger with them than with the middle classes who are too much engrossed with personal interests for the full enjoyment of domestic ties still more evident is their superiority in social feelings strictly so called for these with them are called into daily exercise from earliest childhood here it is that we find the highest and most genuine types of friendship and this even amongst those who are placed in a dependent position aggravated often by the aristocratic prejudices of those above them and whom we might imagine on that account condemned to a lower moral standard we find sincere and simple respect for superiors untainted by civility not vitiated by the pride of learning not disturbed by the jealousies of competition their personal experience of the miseries of life is a constant stimulus to the nobler sympathies in no class is there so strong an incentive to social feeling at least to the feeling of solidarity between contemporaries for all are conscious of the support that they derive from union support which is not at all incompatible with strong individuality of character the sense of continuity with the past has not it is true been sufficiently developed but this is a want which can only be supplied by systematic culture it will hardly be disputed that there are more remarkable instances of prompt and unostentatious self-sacrifice at the call of a great public necessity in this class than in any other note too that in the utter absence of any systematic education all these moral excellences must be looked upon as inherent in that class it is impossible to attribute them to theological influence now that they have so entirely shaken off the old faith 
the type i have described would be generally considered imaginary and at present it is only in paris that it can be fully realized but the fact of its existence in the centre of western europe is enough for all rational observers a type so fully in accordance with what we know of human nature cannot fail ultimately to spread everywhere especially when these spontaneous tendencies are placed under the systematic guidance of positivism these remarks will prepare us to appreciate the wise and generous instincts of the convention in looking to the proletariat as the mainspring of its policy and this is not merely on account of the incidental danger of foreign invasion but in dealing with the larger question of social regeneration which it pursued so ardently though in such ignorance of its true principles owing however to the want of a satisfactory system and the disorder produced by the metaphysical theories of the time the spirit in which this alliance with the people was framed was incompatible with the real object in view it was considered that government ought as a rule to be in the hands of the people now under the special circumstances of the time popular government was undoubtedly very useful the existence of the republic depended almost entirely upon the proletariat the only class that stood unshaken and true to its principles but in the absolute spirit of the received political theories this state of things was regarded as normal a view which is incompatible with the most important conditions of modern society it is of course always right for the people to assist government in carrying out the law even to the extent of physical force should the case require it interference of this subordinate kind whether in foreign or internal questions so far from leading to anarchy is obviously a guarantee for order which ought to exist in every properly constituted society indeed in this respect our habits in france are still very defective men are too often content to remain mere lookers-on while the police to whom they owe their daily protection is doing its duty but for the people to take a direct part in government and to have the final decision of political measures is a state of things which in modern society is only adapted to times of revolution to recognize it as final would lead at once to anarchy were it not so utterly impossible to realize positivism rejects the metaphysical doctrine of the sovereignty of the people but it appropriates all that is really sound in the doctrine and this with reference not merely to exceptional cases but to the normal state while at the same time it guards against the danger involved in its application as an absolute truth in the hands of the revolutionary party the doctrine is generally used to justify the right of insurrection now in positive polity this right is looked upon as an ultimate resource with which no society should allow itself to dispense absolute submission which is too strongly inculcated by modern catholicism would expose us to the danger of tyranny insurrection may be regarded scientifically as a sort of reparative crisis of which societies stand in more need than individuals in accordance with the well-known biological law that the higher and the more complicated the organism the more frequent and also the more dangerous is the pathological state therefore the fear that positivism when generally accepted will encourage passive obedience is perfectly groundless although it is certainly not favourable to the pure revolutionary spirit which would feign to take the disease for the normal type of health its whole character is so essentially relative that it finds no difficulty in accepting subordination as the rule and yet allowing for exceptional cases of revolt a course by which good taste and human dignity are alike satisfied positivism looks upon insurrection as a dangerous remedy that should be reserved for extreme cases but it would never scruple to sanction and even to encourage it when it is really indispensable this is quite compatible with refusing as a rule to submit the decision of political questions and the choice of rulers to judges who are obviously incompetent and who under the influence of positivism will of their own free will abdicate rights which are subversive of order the metaphysical doctrine of the sovereignty of the people contains however a truth of permanent value though in a very confused form this truth positivism separates very distinctly from its dangerous alloy yet without weakening on the contrary with the effect of enforcing its social import there are two distinct conceptions in this doctrine which have hitherto been confounded a political conception applicable to certain special cases a moral conception applicable to all 
in the first place the name of the whole body politic ought to be invoked in the announcement of any special measure of which the motives are sufficiently intelligible and which directly concern the practical interests of the whole community under this head would be included decisions of law courts declarations of war etc when society has reached the positive state and the sense of universal solidarity is more generally diffused there will be even more significance and dignity in such expressions than there is now because the name invoked will no longer be that of a special nation but that of humanity as a whole it would be absurd however to extend this practice to those still more numerous cases where the people is incompetent to express any opinion and has merely to adopt the opinion of superior officers who have obtained its confidence this may be owing either to the difficulty of the question or to the fact of its application being indirect or limited such for instance would be enactments very often of great importance which deal with scientific principles or again most questions relating to special professions or branches of industry in all these cases popular good sense would under positivist influence easily be kept clear from political illusions it is only under the stimulus of metaphysical pride that such illusions become dangerous and the untaught masses have but little experience of this feeling there is however another truth implied in the expression sovereignty of the people it implies that it is the first of duties to concentrate all the efforts of society upon the common good and in this there is a more direct reference to the working class than to any other first on account of their immense numerical superiority and secondly because the difficulties by which their life is surrounded require special interference to a degree which for other classes would be unnecessary from this point of view it is a principle which all true republicans may accept it is in fact identical with what we have laid down as the universal basis of morality the direct and permanent preponderance of social feeling over all personal interests not merely then is it incorporated by positivism but as was shown in the first chapter it forms the primary principle of the system even under the intellectual aspect since the decline of catholicism the metaphysical spirit has been provisionally the guardian of this great social precept positivism now finally appropriates it and purifies it for the future from all taint of anarchy revolutionists as we should expect from their characteristic dislike to the separation of the two powers had treated the question politically positivism avoids all danger by shifting it to the region of morality i shall show presently that this very salutary change so far from weakening the force of the principle increases its permanent value and at the same time removes the deceptive and subversive tendencies which are always involved in the metaphysical mode of regarding it what then it will be asked is the part assigned to the proletariat in the final constitution of society this similarity of position which i pointed out between themselves and the philosophic class suggests the answer they will be of the most essential service to the spiritual power in each of its three social functions judgment counsel and even education all the intellectual and moral qualities that we have just indicated in this class concur in fitting them for this service if we accept the philosophic body which is the recognized organ of general principles there is no class which is so habitually inclined to take comprehensive views of any subject their superiority in social feeling is still more obvious in this even the best philosophers are rarely their equals and it would be a most beneficial corrective of their tendency to over abstraction to come into daily contact with the noble and spontaneous instincts of the people the working class then is better qualified than any other for understanding and still more for sympathizing with the highest truths of morality though it may not be able to give them a systematic form and as we have seen it is in social morality the most important and the highest of the three branches of ethics that their superiority is most observable besides independently of their intrinsic merits whether intellectual or moral the necessities of their daily life serve to impress them with respect for the great rules of morality which in most cases were framed for their own protection to secure the application of these rules in daily life is a function of the spiritual power in the performance of which they will meet with but slight assistance from the middle classes 
it is with them that temporal power naturally resides and it is their misuse of power that has to be controlled and set right the working classes are the chief sufferers from the selfishness and domineering of men of wealth and power for this reason they are the likeliest to come forward in deference of public morality and they will be all the more disposed to give it their hearty support if they have nothing to do directly with political administration habitual participation in temporal power to say nothing of its unsettling influence would lead them away from the best remedy for their sufferings of which the constitution of society admits popular sagacity will soon detect the utter hollowness of the off-hand solutions that are now being obtruded upon us the people will rapidly become convinced that the surest method of satisfying all legitimate claims lies in the moral agencies which positivism offers though it appears to them at the same time to abdicate political power which either yields them nothing or results in anarchy so natural is this tendency of the people to rally round the spiritual power in defence of morality that we find it to have been the case even in medieval times indeed this it is which explains the sympathies which catholicism still retains notwithstanding its general decline in the countries where protestantism has failed to establish itself superficial observers often mistake these sympathies for evidence of sincere attachment to the old creeds though in point of fact they are more thoroughly undermined in those countries than anywhere else it is an historical error which will however soon be corrected by the reception which these nations so wrongly imagined to be in a backward stage of political development will give to positivism for they will soon see its superiority to catholicism in satisfying the primary necessity with which their social instincts are so justly preoccupied in the middle ages however the relations between the working classes and the priesthood were hampered by the institution of serfage which was not wholly abolished until catholicism had begun to decline in fact a careful study of history will show that one of the principal causes of its decline was the want of popular support the medieval church was a noble but premature attempt disbelief in its doctrines and also retrograde tendencies in its directors had virtually destroyed it before the proletariat had attained sufficient social importance to support it successfully supposing it could have deserved their support but we are now sufficiently advanced for the perfect realization of the catholic ideal in positivism and the principal means of realizing it would be the formation of an alliance between philosophers and the working classes for which both are alike prepared by the negative and positive progress of the last five centuries the direct object of their combined action will be to set in motion the force of public opinion all views of the future condition of society the views of practical men as well as of philosophic thinkers agree in the belief that the principal features of the state to which we are tending will be the increased influence which public opinion is destined to exercise it is in this beneficial influence that we shall find the surest guarantee for morality for domestic and even for personal morality as well as for social for as the whole tendency of positivism is to induce every one to live as far as possible without concealment the public will be entrusted with a strong check upon the life of the individual now that all theological illusions have become so entirely obsolete the need of such a check is greater than it was before it compensates for the insufficiency of natural goodness which we find in most men however wisely their education has been conducted except the noblest of joys that which springs from social sympathy when called into constant exercise there is no reward for doing right so satisfactory as the approval of our fellow beings even under theological systems it has been one of our strongest aspirations to live esteemed in the memory of others and still more prominence will be given to this noble form of ambition under positivism because it is the only way left us of satisfying the desire which all men feel of prolonging their life into the future and the increased force of public opinion will correspond to the increased necessity for it the peculiar reality of positive doctrine and its constant conformity with facts facilitate the recognition of its principles and remove all obscurity in their application they are not to be evaded by subterfuges like those to which metaphysical and theological principles from their vague and absolute character have been always liable again the primary principle of positivism 
which is to judge every question by the standard of social interests is in itself a direct appeal to public opinion since the public is naturally the judge of the good or bad effect of action upon the common welfare under theological and metaphysical systems no appeal of this sort was recognized because the objects upheld as the highest aims of life were purely personal End of section 10. Section 11 of A General View of Positivism. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Oxnard. A General View of Positivism by Auguste Comte. Translated by John Henry Bridges. Chapter 3. The Action of Positivism Upon the Working Classes. Part 2. In political questions, the application of our principle is still more obvious. For political morality, public opinion is almost our only guarantee. We feel its force even now, in spite of the intellectual anarchy in which we live. Neutralized as it is in most cases by the wide divergences of men's convictions, yet it shows itself on the occasion of any great public excitement. Indeed, we feel it to our cost sometimes, when the popular mind has taken a wrong direction. Government in such cases being very seldom able to offer adequate resistance. These cases may convince us how irresistible this power will prove when used legitimately, and when it is formed by systematic accordance in general principles instead of by a precarious and momentary coincidence of feeling and here we see more clearly than ever how impossible it is to effect any permanent reconstruction of the institutions of society without a previous reorganization of opinion and of life the spiritual basis is necessary not merely to determine the character of the temporal reconstruction but to supply the principal motive force by which the work is to be carried out. Intellectual and moral harmony will gradually be restored, and under its influence the new political system will by degrees arise. Social improvements of the highest importance may therefore be realised long before the work of spiritual reorganisation is completed. We find in medieval history that Catholicism exercised a powerful influence on society during its emergence from barbarism, before its own internal constitution had advanced far, and this will be the case to a still greater degree with the regeneration which is now in progress. Having defined the sphere within which public opinion should operate, we shall find little difficulty in determining the conditions requisite for its proper organisation. These are, first, the establishment of fixed principles of social action, secondly, their adoption by the public, and its consent to their application in special cases, and, lastly, a recognised organ to lay down the principles and to apply them to the conduct of daily life. Obvious as these three conditions appear, they are still so little understood that it will be well to explain each of them somewhat more fully. The first condition, that of laying down fixed principles, is in fact the extension to social questions of that separation between theory and practice, which in subjects of less importance is universally recognised. This is the aspect in which the superiority of the new spiritual system to the old is most perceptible. The principles of moral and political conduct that were accepted in the Middle Ages were little better than empirical and owed their stability entirely to the sanction of religion. In this respect, indeed, the superiority of Catholicism to the systems which preceded it consisted merely in the fact of separating its precepts from the special application of them. By making its precepts the distinct object of preliminary study, it secured them against the bias of human passions. Yet important as this separation was, the system was so defective intellectually that the successful application of its principles depended simply on the good sense of the teachers, for the principles in themselves were as vague and as absolute as the creeds from which they were derived. The influence exercised by Catholicism was due to its indirect action upon social feeling in the only mode then possible. 
but the claims with which positivism presents itself are far more satisfactory it is based on a complete synthesis one which embraces not the outer world only but the inner world of human nature this while in no way detracting from the practical value of social principles give them the imposing weight of theoretical truth and ensures their stability and coherence by connecting them with the whole series of laws on which the life of man and of society depend for these laws will corroborate even those which are not immediately deduced from them by connecting all our rules of action with the fundamental conception of social duty we render their interpretation in each special case clear and consistent and we secure it against the sophisms of passion principles such as these based on reason and rendering our conduct independent of the impulses of the moment are the only means of sustaining the vigour of social feeling and at the same time of saving us from the errors to which its unguided suggestions so often lead direct and constant culture of social feeling in public as well as in private life is no doubt the first condition of morality but the natural strength of self-love is such that something beside this is required to control it the course of conduct must be traced beforehand in all important cases by the aid of demonstrable principles adopted at first upon trust and afterwards from conviction there is no art whatever in which however ardent and sincere our desire to succeed we can dispense with knowledge of the nature and conditions of the object aimed at moral and political conduct is assuredly not exempt from such an obligation although we are more influenced in this case by the direct promptings of feeling than in any other of the arts of life it has been shown only too clearly by many striking instances how far social feeling may lead us astray when it is not directed by right principles it was for want of fixed convictions that the noble sympathies entertained by the french nation for the rest of europe at the outset of the revolution so soon degenerated into forcible oppression when her retrograde leader began his seductive appeal to selfish passions inverse cases are still more common and they illustrate the connection of feeling and opinion as clearly as the others a false social doctrine has often favoured the natural ascendancy of self-love by giving a perverted conception of public well-being this has been too plainly exemplified in our own time by the deplorable influence which malthus's sophistical theory of population obtained in england this mischievous error met with very little acceptance in the rest of europe and it has been already refuted by the nobler thinkers of his own country but it still gives the show of scientific sanction to the criminal antipathy of the governing classes in great britain to all effectual measures of reform next to a system of principles the most important condition for the exercise of public opinion is the existence of a strong body of supporters sufficient to make the weight of these principles felt now it was here that catholicism proved so weak and therefore even had its doctrine been less perishable its decline was unavoidable but the defect is amply supplied in the new spiritual order which as i have before shown will receive the influential support of the working classes and the need of such assistance is as certain as the readiness with which it will be yielded for though the intrinsic efficacy of positive teaching is far greater than that of any doctrine which is not susceptible of demonstration yet the convictions it inspires cannot be expected to dispense with the aid of vigorous popular support human nature is imperfectly organized and the influence which reason exercises over it is not by any means so great as this supposition would imply even social feeling though its influence is far greater than that of reason would not in general be sufficient for the right guidance of practical life if public opinion were not constantly at hand to support the good inclinations of individuals the arduous struggle of social feeling against self-love requires the constant assertion of true principles to remove uncertainty as to the proper course of action in each case but it requires also something more the strong reaction of all upon each is needed whether to control selfishness or to stimulate sympathy the tendency of our poor and weak nature to give way to the lower propensities is so great that but for this universal cooperation feeling and reason 
would be almost inadequate to their task in the working class we find the requisite conditions they will as we have seen form the principal source of opinion not merely from their numerical superiority but also from their intellectual and moral qualities as well as from the influence directly due to their social position thus it is that positivism views the great problem of human life and shows us for the first time that the basis of a solution already exists in the very structure of the social organism working men whether as individuals or what is still more important collectively are now at liberty to criticize all the details and even the general principles of the social system under which they live affecting as it necessarily does themselves more nearly than any other class the remarkable eagerness lately shown by our people to form clubs though there was no special motive for it and no very marked enthusiasm was a proof that the checks which had previously prevented this tendency from showing itself were quite unsuited to our times nor is this tendency likely to pass away on the contrary it will take deeper root and extend more widely because it is thoroughly in keeping with the habits feelings and wants of working men who form the majority in these meetings a consistent system of social truth will largely increase their influence by giving them a more settled character and a more important aim so far from being in any way destructive they form a natural though imperfect model of the mode of life which will ultimately be adopted in the regenerate condition of humanity in these unions social sympathies are kept in constant action by a stimulus of a most beneficial kind they offer the speediest and most effectual means of elaborating public opinion this at least is the case when there has been a fair measure of individual training no one at present has any idea of the extent of the advantages which will one day spring from these spontaneous meetings when there is an adequate system of general principles to direct them spiritual reorganization will find them its principal basis of support for they secure its acceptance by the people and this will have the greater weight because it will always be given without compulsion or violence the objection that meetings of this kind may lead to dangerous political agitation rests upon a misinterpretation of the events of the revolution so far from their stimulating a desire for what are called political rights or encouraging their exercise in those who possess them their tendency is quite in the opposite direction they will soon divert working men entirely from all useless attempts to interfere with existing political institutions and bring them to their true social function that of assisting and carrying out the operations of the new spiritual power it is a noble prospect which is thus held out to them by positivism a prospect far more inviting than any of the metaphysical illusions of the day the real intention of the club is to form a provisional substitute for the church of old times or rather to prepare the way for the religious building of the new form of worship the worship of humanity which as i shall explain in a subsequent chapter will be gradually introduced under the regenerating influence of positive doctrine under our present republican government all progressive tendencies are allowed free scope and therefore it will not be long before our people accept this new vent for social sympathies which in former times could find expression only in catholicism in this theory of public opinion one condition yet remains to be described a philosophic organ is necessary to interpret the doctrine the influence of which would otherwise in most cases be very inadequate this third condition has been much disputed but it is certainly even more indispensable than the second and in fact it has never been really wanting for every doctrine must have had some founder and usually has a permanent body of teachers it would be difficult to conceive that a system of moral and political principles should be possessed of great social influence and yet at the same time that the men who originate or inculcate the system should exercise no spiritual authority it is true that this inconsistency did for a time exist under the negative and destructive influence of protestantism and deism because men's thoughts were for the time entirely taken up with the struggle to escape from the retrograde tendencies of catholicism during this long period of insurrection each individual became a sort of priest each that is followed his own interpretation of a doctrine which needed no special teachers 
because its function was not to construct but to criticize all the constitutions that have been recently established on metaphysical principles give a direct sanction to this state of things in the preambles with which they commence they apparently regard each citizen as competent to form a sound opinion on all social questions thus exempting him from the necessity of applying to any special interpreters this extension to the normal state of things of a phase of mind only suited to the period of revolutionary transition is an error which i have already sufficiently refuted in the minor arts of life it is obvious that general principles cannot be laid down without some theoretical study and that the application of these rules to special cases is not to be entirely left to the untaught instinct of the artisan and can it be otherwise with the art of social life so far harder and more important than any other and in which from its principles being less simple and less precise a special explanation of them in each case is even more necessary however perfect the demonstration of social principles may become it must not be supposed that knowledge of positive doctrine even when it has been taught in the most efficient way will dispense with the necessity of frequently appealing to the philosopher for advice in questions of practical life whether private or public and this necessity of an interpreter to intervene occasionally between the principle and its application is even more evident from the moral than it is from the intellectual aspect certain as it is that no one will be so well acquainted with the true character of the doctrine as the philosopher who teaches it it is even more certain that none is so likely as himself to possess the moral qualifications of purity of exalted aims and of freedom from party spirit without which his counsels could have but little weight in reforming individual or social conduct it is principally through his agency that we may hope in most cases to bring about that reaction of all upon each which as we have seen is of such indispensable importance to practical morality philosophers are not indeed the principal source of public opinion as intellectual pride so often leads them to believe public opinion proceeds essentially from the free voice and spontaneous cooperation of the people but in order that the full weight of their unanimous judgment may be felt it must be announced by some recognized organ there are no doubt rare cases where the direct expression of popular feeling is enough but these are quite exceptional thus working men and philosophers are mutually necessary not merely in the creation of public opinion but also in most cases in the manifestation of it without the first the doctrine however well established would not have sufficient force without the second it would usually be too incoherent to overcome those obstacles in the constitution of man and of society which make it so difficult to bring practical life under the influence of fixed principles in fact this necessity for some systematic organ to direct and give effect to public opinion has always been felt even amidst the spiritual anarchy which at present surrounds us on every occasion in which such opinion has played any important part for its effect on these occasions would have been null and void but for some individual to take the initiative and personal responsibility this is frequently verified in private life by cases in which we see the opposite state of things we see principles which no one would think of contesting practically inadequate for want of some recognized authority to apply them it is a serious deficiency which is however compensated though imperfectly by the greater facility of arriving at the truth in such cases and by the greater strength of the sympathies which they call forth but in public life with its more difficult conditions and more important claims such entire absence of systematic intervention could never be tolerated in all public transactions even now we may perceive the participation of a spiritual authority of one kind or other the organs of which though constantly varying are in most cases metaphysicians or literary men writing for the press thus even in the present anarchy of feelings and convictions public opinion cannot dispense with guides and interpreters only it has to be content with men who at the best can only offer the guarantee of personal responsibility without any reliable security either for the stability of their convictions or the purity of their feelings but now that the problem of organizing public opinion has once been proposed by positivism it cannot remain long without a solution it plainly reduces itself to the principle of separating the two social powers 
just as we have seen that the necessity of an established doctrine rested on the analogous principle of separating theory from practice it is clear on the one hand that sound interpretation of moral and political rules as in the case of any other art can only be furnished by philosophers engaged in the study of the natural laws on which they rest on the other hand these philosophers in order to preserve that breadth and generality of view which is their principal intellectual characteristic must abstain scrupulously from all regular participation in practical affairs and especially from political life on the ground that its specialising influence would soon impair their speculative capacity and such a course is equally necessary on moral grounds it helps to preserve purity of feeling and impartiality of character qualities essential to their influence upon public as well as upon private life such in outline is the positive theory of public opinion in each of its three constituent elements the doctrine the power and the organ it is intimately connected with the whole question of spiritual reorganization or rather it forms the simplest mode of viewing that great subject all the essential parts of it are closely related to each other positive principles on the one hand cannot count on much material support except from the working classes these in their turn will for the future regard positivism as the only doctrine with which they can sympathize so again with the philosophic organs of opinion without the people their necessary independence cannot be established or sustained to our literary classes the separation of the two powers is instinctively repugnant because it would lay down systematic limits to the unwise ambition which we now see in them and it will be disliked as strongly by the rich classes who will look with fear upon a new moral authority destined to impose an irresistible check upon their selfishness at present it will be generally understood and welcomed only by the proletary class who have more aptitude for general views and for social sympathy in france especially they are less under the delusion of metaphysical sophisms and of aristocratic prestige than any other class and the positivist view of this primary condition of social regeneration will find a ready entrance into their minds and hearts our theory of public opinion shows us at once how far we have already gone in organizing this great regulator of modern society how far we still fall short of what is wanted the doctrine has at last arisen there is no doubt of the existence of the power and even the organ is not wanting but they do not as yet stand in their right relation to each other the effective impulse towards social regeneration depends then on one ultimate condition the formation of a firm alliance between philosophers and proletaries of this powerful coalition i have already spoken i have now to explain the advantages which it offers to the people in the way of obtaining sufficient recognition of all legitimate claims of these advantages the principal and that by which the rest will speedily be developed and secured is the important social function which is hereby conferred upon them they become auxiliaries of the new spiritual power auxiliaries indispensable to its action this vast proletary class which ever since its rise in the middle ages has been shut out from the political system will now assume the position for which by nature it is best adapted and which is most conducive to the general well-being of society its members independently of their special vocation will at last take a regular and most important part in public life a part which will compensate for the hardships inseparable from their social position their combined action far from disturbing the established order of things will be its most solid guarantee from the fact of being moral not political and here we see definitely the alteration which positivism introduces in the revolutionary conception of the action of the working classes upon society for stormy discussions about rights it substitutes peaceable definitions of duties it supersedes useless disputes for the possession of power by inquiring into the rules that should regulate its wise employment a superficial observer of the present state of things might imagine our working classes to be as yet very far from this frame of mind but he who looks deeper into the question will see that the very experiment which they are now trying of extending their political rights will soon have the effect of showing them the hollowness of a remedy which has so slight a bearing on the objects really important to them 
without making any formal abdication of rights which might seem inconsistent with their social dignity there is little doubt that their instinctive sagacity will lead them to the still more efficacious plan of indifference positivism will readily convince them that where a spiritual power in order to do its work must ramify in every direction it is essential to public order that political power should be as a rule concentrated and this conviction will grow upon them as they see more clearly that the primary social problems which are very properly absorbing their attention are essentially moral rather than political one step in this direction they have already taken of their own accord though its importance has not been duly appreciated the well-known scheme of communism which has found such rapid acceptance with them serves in the absence of sounder doctrine to express the way in which they are now looking at the great social problem the experience of the first part of the revolution has not yet wholly disabused them of political illusions but it has at least brought them to feel that property is of more importance than power in the ordinary sense of the word so far communism has given a wider meaning to the great social problem and has thereby rendered an essential service which is not neutralized by the temporary dangers involved in the metaphysical forms in which it comes before us communism should therefore be carefully distinguished from the numerous extravagant schemes brought forward in this time of spiritual anarchy a time which stimulates incompetence and ill-trained minds to the most difficult subjects of thought the foolish schemes referred to have so few definite features that we have to distinguish them by the names of their authors but communism bears the name of no single author and is something more than an accidental product of anomalous circumstances we should look upon it as the natural progress in the right direction of the revolutionary spirit progress of a moral rather than intellectual kind it is a proof that revolutionary tendencies are now concentrating themselves upon moral questions leaving all purely political questions in the background it is quite true that the solution of the problem which communists are now putting forward is still as essentially political as that of their predecessors since the only mode by which they propose to regulate the employment of property is by a change in the mode of its tenure still it is owing to them that the question of property is at last brought forward for discussion and it is a question which so evidently needs a moral solution the solution of it by political means is at once so inadequate and so destructive that it cannot long continue to be debated without leading to the more satisfactory result offered by positivism men will see that it forms a part of the final regeneration of opinion and of life which positivism is now inaugurating to do justice to communism we must look at the generous sympathies by which it is inspired not to the shallow theories in which those sympathies find expression provisionally until circumstances enable them to take some other shape our working classes caring but very little for metaphysical principles do not attach nearly the same importance to these theories as is done by men of literary education as soon as they see a better way of bringing forward the points on which they have legitimate claims they will very soon adopt the clear and practical conceptions of positivism which can be carried out peaceably and permanently in preference to these vague and confused chimeras which as they will instinctively feel lead only to anarchy till then they will naturally abide by communism as the only method of bringing forward the most fundamental of social problems in a way which there shall be no evading the very alarm which their present solution to the problem arouses helps to stir public attention and fix it on this great subject but for this constant appeal to their fears the metaphysical delusions and aristocratic self-seeking of the governing classes would shelve the question altogether or pass it by with indifference the errors of communism must be rectified but there is no necessity for giving up the name which is a simple assertion of the paramount importance of social feeling however now that we have happily passed from monarchy to republicanism the name of communist is no longer indispensable the word republican expresses the meaning as well and without the same danger positivism then has nothing to fear from communism on the contrary it will probably be accepted by most communists among the working classes especially in france where abstractions have but little influence on minds thoroughly emancipated from theology the people will gradually find that the solution of the great social problem which positivism offers is better than the communistic solution 
a tendency in this direction has already shown itself since the first edition of this work was published the working classes have now adopted a new expression socialism thus indicating that they accept the problem of the communists while rejecting their solution indeed that solution would seem to be finally disposed of by the voluntary exile of their leader yet if the socialists at present keep clear of communism it is only because their position is one of criticism or inaction if they were to succeed to power with principles so far below the level of their sympathies they would inevitably fall into the same errors and extravagances which they now instinctively feel to be wrong consequently the rapid spread of socialism very naturally alarms the upper classes and their resistance blind though it be is at present the only guarantee for material order in fact the problem brought forward by the communists admits of no solution but their own so long as the revolutionary confusion of temporal and spiritual power continues therefore the universal blame that is lavished on these utopian schemes cannot fail to inspire respect for positivism as the only doctrine which can preserve western europe from some serious attempt to bring communism into practical operation positivists stand forward now as the party of construction with a definite basis for political action namely systematic prosecution of the wise attempt of medieval statesmen to separate the two social powers on this basis they are enabled to satisfy the poor and at the same time to restore the confidence of the rich it is a final solution of our difficulties which will make the titles of which we have been speaking unnecessary stripping the old word republican of any false meaning at present attached to it we may retain it as the best expression of the social sympathies on which the regeneration of society depends for the opinions manners and even institutions of future society positivist is the only word suitable the peculiar reality of positivism and its invariable tendency to concentrate our intellectual powers upon social questions are attributes both of which involve its adoption as the essential principle of communism that principle being that property is in its nature social and that it needs control end of section eleven